up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of the Bullets, Barbells, and Barbecue Podcast. I'm your host, Brett. I have Chris, the artist formerly known as Heavy C. I got Matt, pooped his pants twice in one day. And we have Tanner, the head. Uh, we'll go to our show partners first. We have Elite Nutrition Omaha. Check them out at EliteNutritionOmaha.com. Use code B3 at checkout for 10% off. Go in the store, you'll be three. Get a free shaker. We got Rosewood Block. They make the best cutting boards and barbecue. Uh, check them out. Fully customizable. Use code B3 at checkout. Also, if you like what we're doing or you hate what we're doing, Share, like, subscribe, tell people how much you don't like us, and go from there. <laughs> <laughs> and now on with the show. So today we have a special guest. We have Dr. Jamie Seaman, Dr. Fit and Fabulous, Titan Games competitor, uh, local OB here in Omaha, kind of done a lot of things, played some softball in college. A little bit. So <laughs> she's got a story in life in general, but yeah. uh, we, we appreciate you coming on. Thanks I know for you're super busy. Yeah, appreciate this is it. fun. So we kind of want to talk about, because I've been doing personal training for like probably 20 years and working with pregnant women, obviously. That's, uh, <laughs> it happens? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know how it happens. Yeah, but just, right? They just keep showing up. <laughs> well, it keeps you busy. Something in the water. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in different training, I feel like even that has evolved over the years. There used to be so many different restrictions, different trimesters, and now I feel like it's all just kind of like, out the window they're just like if you feel okay yeah like just go well that's pretty much like what the how the science has evolved i mean for so many years we looked at pregnant women like they were in this little eggshell you know like you had to tippy toe around them you know don't do anything crazy because i think a lot of people are really afraid to give a recommendation to a pregnant patient because you're really talking about two patients, right? They've got this small human inside their body and there's so much incredible, you know, metabolic demand and growth and development. And I think everyone's afraid that if they missed up, something's going to happen and the baby's going to come out with two heads or something. Um, and so a lot of the advice that was given to pregnant women, even in the clinic offices was very antiquated. You know, it was that this was a very vulnerable time in their life and they should take it easy and they should, you know, eat whatever they want. And we now know that that advice is, it, it really wasn't based in science at all. <laughs> no, and it's, Surprise. It, it's funny if you like, just like Google, like workouts for pregnant women, the first one's like, well, try not to do any contact sports, like kickboxing. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I didn't think that that was really happening. Right. Right. But right. you know, um, it's, we're, we have seen this evolution and, and I think that social media and just media in general has helped, you know, some of these messages and has raised a lot of questions about what pregnant women should and shouldn't do. But a lot of the reason that there's not good founded science is because it's really hard ethically to study pregnant patients, right? So uh, let's just take alcohol, for instance. There was a period of time when we treated preeclampsia by infusing IV ethanol to pregnant patients. Well, now we're like, that sounds like a dumb idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, there, there are a lot of discoveries that happen in medicine that, you know, turn out to be really bad ideas. And so when you're talking about a pregnant patient, ethically, you, you really can't randomize the trial and say, okay, you ladies do this and you ladies do this and we're going to see what happens. It, you know, just ethically, you can't do that. But certainly we can observe, we have pregnant women that are like, well, I'm going to drink in my pregnancy. I'll show you what happens. You know, so we have a lot of observational data, um, and, but that's all we have. It. And they've done some interesting case reports, right? Like elite athletes of the world, which is not most women, um, where they've hooked up monitors, uh, even in labor, they've hooked in fetal scalp electrodes and, and, and all these invasive monitors because these women were willing to do that. And that's really cool that people, you know, provide that kind of science, yeah, but, for sure. but in the real everyday world, it's, it's a, it's a hard thing to study. And let's be real. Most women at baseline, aren't fit, they're not working out, and they're probably not likely to start just suddenly initiating this in the middle of a pregnancy. Now, when you say like ethically, like, what do you mean? Like, you know what I mean? Like if they're okay with it or what's the ethical right well, and wrong of that? Yeah. I mean, basically in basic science research, we have an ethical burden, meaning, you know, if we know that there is a possibility of some sort of harm, we, we really can't ask people to sign up for a randomized trial for that. Um, and, and so that's why in pregnancy it's, dif it's difficult because you're talking about two patients. And like I said, there's always been this perception that pregnant women are, well, I mean, they are more vulnerable, but it's just, you know, you can't, when you're talking about a newborn baby and you don't know what the outcome could or couldn't be, you know, okay. you really just can't ethically say, 
okay, here, you do this and you do that and we'll you see can't, what happens. You can't do a double blind study and yeah. say, hey, you're going to do this and you're going to do this. And if this goes bad. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and exercise in general, right? There's, there's this perception that it's hard and we do know physiologically it is a strain on the system. And so, you know, to say, let's put them through some sort of intensity of workout or let's see how much they can lift. And then let's see what happens that that's difficult to do. What do you, what do you think the science is behind? Cause I, the girls I've worked with, the comeback is so much better. Mm hmm. No, obviously being physically, if they, tra if they train, if they've trained all the way through yeah. mm -hmm. or a good portion. I mean, when I worked at 24 hour fitness, I'm pretty sure one of the spin instructors just stepped off the bike, had her kid and like got back on. I never <laughs> like saw her not teach a class. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, but the recovery, like, and obviously, like we said, we know anytime you're working out, being stronger is always going to be better. But the, what do you, what do you think the, this, the science behind the recovery is so much better? Well, when you think about childbirth, it is a, it is a physical feat. I mean, if you have never seen a woman in labor, natural labor, I mean, it is, it is this like primal, amazing, I get to sit there and just witness this incredible physiology. And that's the thing is it's a physiologic process in medicine. We are designed to diagnose pathology. So we are designed to find things that go wrong. The cool part about my job is the healthy, normal people are the best patients to take care of, but, but labor is difficult. You know, you don't know if it's going to be a couple hours. You don't know if it's going to be a 48 hour process. And then to physically birth a baby, you need strength, you need stamina. And so when you're talking about these women who do work out and they seem to recover or quote unquote bounce back faster, it makes total sense because if somebody is signing themselves up for a marathon or an Ironman or whatever it is, and they don't train from it, I mean, trying to go do something untrained is going to wreck them for a long time. I mean, that's, you know, there's going to be more injuries. It's going to be difficult to come back. That is exactly how I view labor. It is a very physical feat and the better shape you can get yourself into before you go into that type of event, you're going to come back from it better. Well, like to my next part, like where you talked about, you know, training for a marathon, we can get very sports specific, right? Like I always tell people, you might see somebody doing something really stupid in the gym, but it can be very sports specific to what they're right. doing. Now, obviously labor is a very internal event that happens. I thought you were going to say sports specific. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very sport specific. <laughs> but I can't train the uterus. Yeah. But. So do you think it's more of, because obviously through weight training, the, 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 the stress it puts on the nervous system, which I think over the years I've always on that trip, everybody thinks they don't need to recover, but your nervous system takes a beating you'll never understand all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. So do you think that the training up through is more, and with labor is more of the training of the nervous system to be able to handle the stress? Because muscularly, like, I mean, I've never like been right there. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but muscularly, like, what are you, I mean, what are you going to train specifically? Like, well, I'm getting ready. Got a big labor coming up. Gonna fucking hit it hard. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, I think of that kind of in like two ways. First is, is the, the physical aspect. So, you know, <clears throat> I mean, if you've ever seen a laboring woman, I mean, it is, it is physically hard. I mean, there's points where your legs are giving out, you got to keep changing positions. You're once again, it could take hours or days, you know, and then when you finally get to complete dilation, you have to physically, you have to push this baby out. I mean, you could lay there and passively birth a baby. I mean, we watch, you know, national geographic, that's what animals do. Right? Like yeah. they don't have like a doctor yeah. or a doula standing next to them. Like, okay, push. elephant push, right? Like push. the body just yeah. like does it. And, and in naturally laboring women, they do, they instead instinctually they know when to when to bear down and when to you know push the baby out but it's it's physically difficult so one is just getting yourself in, in physical shape to endure that. And it's the amount of lean tissue you have. It's the quality of your lean tissue. Um, being at a normal weight, we know that women who have obesity have more what we call labor dystocias, meaning they're more likely to have labors where they don't dilate or they get to complete and they can't push the baby out. And it, it's just because they're, they're physically unhealthy you know, there's inflammation. It's, there's reasons why the, the physiology of birth goes haywire in those situations when somebody is not healthy. But at the second aspect I think is the mental aspect and labor is a mental mind game because you're going to be in a position where you've been in the most discomfort you've ever been in your entire life. You have no idea how long this race is. You don't, you, I mean, that's the thing I tell women, a marathon, you know, it's 26.2. 
I don't know if this is a sprint or a marathon. It might be one, it might be the other, it might be somewhere in between. And so there's a mental aspect. And when you go into the gym, you start to learn kind of that like mental fortitude of like pushing past that point where it's hard and it's difficult and you want to quit and you want to throw in the towel. That's a, I mean, it's, it's such a, a microcosm of birth, like, you know, getting sure. through these hard reps and sets and going into the, into the birth and knowing that there is a finish line. Eventually you will, you will not leave the room pregnant. I promise you <laughs> the baby is coming out <laughs> one way or another. Um, and so I think that that, that is another aspect of, of training in pregnancy is getting yourself kind of, you know, visualizing the event. We don't know how it will go exactly, but just, you know, visualizing it, seeing it, feeling it, and then recovering from it. Cause it's one of the most incredible things, but it, it's exhausting and, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally. What if someone, so if someone is generally untrained and they're going and they're, they're now pregnant, is it recommended? Is there a benefit to them to try to improve their GPP and be a little more physically prepared as they get closer? Or is it just kind of like maintain what you have and try not to or is it, Yeah, is that extra stress well, on the baby or in the, in the pregnant person? No, we know it's, we know it's safe to initiate exercise in pregnancy, even if a woman is completely untrained. So if you find yourself pregnant and you're like, Oh my gosh, I don't want high blood pressure and diabetes. And I want this birth to go well. It is okay to initiate pregnancy or initiate exercise in pregnancy. If you're completely untrained now, obviously they're starting from a completely untrained state. Their capacity right. is going to be a lot less than somebody that's been training, but it's okay to start during pregnancy. Okay. And that is something that has been like this, you know, little, myth out there that, you know, if they've never lifted a weight before, they probably shouldn't start now. And we can talk about some of the physiologic adaptations that happen in pregnancy, but it is okay to start right. training. And they should, because we know that it decreases their risk of gestational hypertension, gestational diabetes, gaining too much weight in pregnancy. And then once again, it's just this aspect of actually getting in shape to give birth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it, like, I, obviously you're, I feel like you have a similar mindset that like probably all of us do as far as working out and yeah, people will go to the doctor, not pregnant, just regular. Oh, well, you know, don't lift anything over five pounds, you know, which is normally nine times out of 10 shitty. Cause there's not many things that are under five pounds. You're going to lift. <laughs> um, but do you ever have restrictions? Like, cause like I said, you're, I feel like you're very, like very pro working out, very pro weight training. I mean, I mean the, like the point of your book, like, you know, no one's coming to save you. Like, obviously you, you have to build yourself to survive. Right. But exactly. are there, do you ever put any restrictions on someone as far as when you're seeing them? Like, even if they're an in-shape person, do you have anything that you normally tell your patients, like, don't do this or do more of this? Yeah. I mean, if it's an uncomplicated pregnancy, there really aren't any restrictions. There was some arbitrary advice, uh, you know, even in the medical literature. So my governing organization is called the American College of OBGYN. So they put out general guidance for things. And there's a, a complete article that's available to all OBGYNs to read about exercise and pregnancy. And it has some like arbitrary things like don't get your heart rate above 80% max heart rate. Well, it didn't really come from like a study. It was just like, everybody felt like that yeah. was like a safe We're zone. We're pretty sure as like, long as you're under that, like we can't Yeah, like don't go to a hundred, but 80 sounds good. I feel like that's like a fat girl getting off the couch. <laughs> I mean, that's like <laughs> max effort <laughs> exercise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and women will find that once you become pregnant, I mean, the, the percent of max heart rate actually starts to change um, because the blood volume expansion that happens. So there's a plasma volume expansion. There's a red blood cell volume expansion. The, the, capacity of the lungs starts to change as you get upward pressure on the diaphragm. So even the fittest person starts to realize that they're going to get out of breath faster. Yeah. Their heart rate's going to go up faster, especially as you progress through the trimesters of pregnancy. Um, but, but a lot of that advice of like, how much should you lift? You know, how hard should you work out is, is very arbitrary. I tell patients it's probably not the time to try to set a PR. Uh, you might need modifications as you go through the pregnancy, but it's okay to continue yeah. to, to kind of push yourself a little bit. Um, it, you know, it's, it would be very easy to just say, Oh, well I'm pregnant. Like <laughs> let's just do the elliptical and lift some five pound dumbbells. And I'm sure nobody would bat an eye at you. Right. Well, especially because the old stigma 
in but tradition of it, basically. Certain parts of pregnancy are a catabolic state. So you are you are literally breaking down your body to shuttle all of these nutrients and all of these things to your baby. And unfortunately, it can take a huge toll on a woman's body if she's not getting adequate nutrition, if she's not continuing to get that stimulus in her lean tissue. I mean, I always say the <laughs> like the placenta is team fetus. So whatever that kid needs, it will take it from the mom. And so it's a really important that you want to be physically strong and able to continue to take care of that kid until at least yeah. 18, right? Was, was that when you're legally <laughs> obligated to? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're 18, fuck you right. later, And then they're on their own. <laughs> yeah. cool. um, you know, so it's like you have to think about that is, you know, it's not just giving birth either. It's like being well enough to like be a parent for a long time. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. Like how, if you, if you went into, into pregnancy with call it a performance level of 100, right? And you just maintain just because of the physiological physiological changes. You will. How I've far down the track that has do you go down? <laughs> like, do you go from a hundred down to sixty down to? Well, I mean, I'd I mean, be like pulling this out of my ass. But right. Just total. Like, yeah. Just yeah. That's anecdotal. where most of our stuff comes from. Yeah. 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 That's fine. And we don't cite anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there. Um, like, for instance, nutrients. The more well-designed studies would say it takes three years to replete the nutrient deficit that occurs during pregnancy and breastfeeding, which most people aren't even waiting three years between pregnancies. Right. I mean, I have three daughters and they're 23 months apart. So when you think about just from like a nutrition standpoint, like that is, that is really hard on the body. Yeah. Um, pregnancy is very catabolic towards the end and, and breastfeeding. It, I mean, is really nutritionally de more nutritionally demanding than a pregnancy is. So, you know, if a woman's doing that for a year postpartum, I mean, that's, that's, it's a road to recovery. And I would say if people come into pregnancy at a hundred, I mean, I would say they're, they're at least coming out at a 75, but okay. to get back to a hundred, we have to yeah. get past the expectation that that happens yeah. in six to eight weeks postpartum, yeah. you know, especially if they're yeah. breastfeeding. Just trying to like wrap your head around the fact of like, if you have like, you enter something and you're like, hey, I'm physically prepared. I can do X, Y, and Z, but not thinking far enough ahead to be like, at some point, I'm only going to be at 70% capacity. So like, what does that look like? Yeah. As you, as you kind of approach and try to maintain or build off. And I think you find those athletes that are, you know, maybe they're former athletes, they're very competitive, they will break and defy the limits, yeah. right? You know, we've seen like some of these CrossFit athletes, Tia Claire Toomey, like, you know, coming right. back a year later and trying to compete at a really high level. I mean, there's always going to be outliers, but I think people have to yeah. understand that you're, you're not going to come back 100% right yeah. away. Like the most, the, I think most people walk around it just kind of, just barely meeting that threshold of successfully navigating the physical requirements of life. Yeah. And so if you walk around at that level, sure, that works today, but you enter pregnancy and now you're six months pregnant, you're not at that level anymore. You're down here, plus you have all these other constraints and pulls on you. That right. If you just go through pregnancy, pa pregnancy passively, like you're going to tick down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then yeah, you're, you're not at that successful level anymore. You're, you're below. Yeah. And there's a lot more complications that come along with it. Absolutely. I had a friend who was, <clears throat> we did CrossFit together. And when she was two weeks before labor, we did Fran. So she did, it's 21, 15 pull-ups and, uh, Impressive. but I strapped a medicine ball to my stomach with yeah. cellophane. To try and mimic it. How'd yeah. that go? Uh, not very well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I finished, but I thought I was going to die. But to your, to your point about <clears throat> breastfeeding and then like as we get like second, third trimester, is, do you have a calorie, like calorie increase? I've heard like breastfeeding is like 400 extra calories a day. I don't know if that's pulled out of a ass, someone's ass or not, yeah. but is it... Somewhere in that range, or is it kind of you just? It's going to be production? different for every person, you know, based on their body composition. I mean, you guys know body composition, BMR, are you know all of these different inputs that essentially you know make what our base, you yeah. know, what we need. As a very rough estimate, first trimester only need about 100 calories. Second trimester, 200. Third trimester, 300. And breastfeeding could be upwards of four or 500. Okay. So it's more Holy than shit, pregnancy. Really? And that's because the baby's bigger, right? You think yeah. of this like little gummy bear versus this like little, you know, 10 Watermelon. pound monster. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they demand more. Um, and so, but it is going to be different for every person. The thing that women really need to hear though is... We are constantly talking about just like calories this and calories that, but it's really the nutrients. So I tell women, you really have to focus on the nutrient quality of your food and not just necessarily calories, because let's be real. They, I mean, 
a hundred, 200 to 300 calories, like, you know, that one snicker bar. Okay. Boom. Got it. Right. right. But there's no nutrients <laughs> yeah. in that. So are you talking about micro and macronutrient, like the whole, the whole scheme. Yeah. So for macronutrients, there is an increased protein and fat requirement in pregnancy, not necessarily increased carb requirement, but definitely increased protein okay. and fat requirement. And most women aren't good about hitting protein requirements yeah. at baseline. They'll so crush now, the carbs though. Crush yeah. Right. And carbs. so you know what happens is the body will just tap into its amino acid stores. Well, what's that? That's your muscle. Right. So here you are just like, you know, draining your lean mass if they're not getting the good protein requirements. And then a micronutrient standpoint, yes. Um, things like folate, choline, uh, vitamin D. I mean, you know, the list goes on and on um, of, of what pregnant women need. And yeah. most of those are found in whole foods. Most of them are found in animal foods. So meat, eggs, milk, you know, the things that are vilified and we're told to <laughs> eat in small quantities because they're going to clog our arteries. So when these women come into pregnancy, I mean, a lot of them are getting their nutrients from fortified grains. Yeah. They're continuing to eat processed foods that have a lot of, you know, energy calories and not necessarily nutrients. Yeah. With the increase in, in the protein and the fat looking dude, would that be, I mean, whatever my, my macronutrient is right now, I need a hundred calories more. I just make up that hundred calories in more protein and more fat, or do I need to shift whatever my base is? And so like maybe my carbs have to come down because I have to bump up more protein and more fat than just that like 100, 200, 300. Yeah. So the Institute of Medicine who looks at the nutritional requirements of pregnancy basically says that there's no upper limit of protein and fat that would be harmful in pregnancy. So, you know, yeah, I encourage revise. them, you know, choose the fat. Don't be eating like lean chicken and white fish, like choose the fattier cuts of, of your protein. That's an easy way to get those calories, you know, add some avocado. Um, the trouble with pregnancy is as you progress through the trimesters, you become naturally more insulin resistant and it is a physiologic adaptation of pregnancy to become more insulin resistant because that ensures that there is a, a free flow of both glucose and fatty acids that are going across the placenta okay. to the baby. It's, it's by nature's design. Um, the unfortunate part is if you're eating a ton of excess, you know, an excessive amount of carbohydrates, there are ramifications to the baby. Uh, long-term we have studies that show that basically excessive consumption of carbohydrates in, in pregnancy drives long-term insulin resistance, diabetes, and heart disease in the offspring. And it's probably through uh, what we call epigenetics. So it's literally like the maternal nutrition can turn off these little light switches on and off inside the baby's DNA, which is wild to right. think, That's right? Crazy. What you it's eat. so yeah. crazy to think. Um, Cause right. Women were like, well, I'll just have a bowl of ice cream. Like, you know, I'm pregnant. <laughs> right. yeah. It's a free ticket. Uh, but it's really interesting. We are we are literally changing our DNA for generations yeah. to come by the things that we choose to do or not do in pregnancy. Is diet becoming? I mean, if you can if you can kind of turn these things off and on just based on what you eat, is the diet conversation becoming a bigger? Obviously, I've never had a consultation about being pregnant, but like, is that <laughs> is that a bigger conversation? Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> We can schedule you one. Right, yeah. I mean, sure. I'll, we'll, yeah, we'll go through it. I want to be there. On this day and age, yeah, I mean. Yeah, exactly. You can do whatever the fuck you want. Uh, yeah, I'll be surprised. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but is that becoming, assuming that that has, because it seems like diet's always, diet and what you eat is always kind of shifted to the side or kind of the back of the conversation when we go and we get checkups and, yeah. and we're evaluating. Is that becoming a bigger part just in general of the conversation around pregnancy or is it still kind of like. I wish my answer could be yes, but. You know, in traditional medicine, you know, a return OB visit is like five or 10 minutes long and we're listening to the baby's heartbeat and we're measuring your tummy. How are you doing? Just are you puking? No, snapshot. you're good. Right. We have so many little boxes that we have to check, you know, just at baseline in a pregnancy. I, I don't think it's getting the conversation it deserves. Thankfully, social media, podcasts like yeah. this, women are kind of like starting to hear this conversation and some patients care about it. And frank, frankly, some patients don't care. But they never will either. Yeah. I was just um, and, that. But that's yeah. just like the like, American like, diet in general. Right. Yeah. Like it's just, you know, processed foods are cheap and palatable and easily available everywhere. So, so. with the diet stuff, is that's where, is this like what is making kids weird now where they can't eat peanut butter and they can't, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Is that from, does it stem from then? It, I mean, 
Yeah. I, I just mean, don't remember kids being allergic to peanut well, butter when I was younger. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> a- allergies, um, autism. I mean, you know, the list is long and scientists are trying to figure out why is it happening. I mean, if you look at what's happened to our food since the 1980s, which is essentially when the first kind of like big dietary guidelines for Americans were created, all we've seen is an increase in obesity, diabetes, heart disease, but I think the list is is more extensive than that. Behavioral disorders, autism, allergies, autoimmune disorders. I don't think it's just diet. I think it's a combination of, of probably a lot of things, but that's always the unfortunate trade-off of, you know, advanced, like technology and agriculture. And mm-hmm. there's always a trade-off mm-hmm. when you mess with nature. And we've been really good at messing that up now for quite a long time. (laughs) Yeah. And it's not an easy thing to unravel, but I think people, you know, just really need to understand that when you're talking about a pregnant patient, you know, everything she does has the ability to uh, affect that baby. And that's why going back to the beginning of the podcast, that's why it's hard to study it because we just want to like wrap them in bubble wrap and hope it turns out. Okay. Well, I just saw a study the other day that it was 62 women but all 62 pregnant women, the placenta had microplastics in it, a mm-hmm. 100% of them. Yeah, no, that's been actually known for a while. They've done umbilical cord studies. Um, there's Why? phthalates and microplastics and and so many things. And, and the placenta can really only do so much. There's a there's a, a particle size essentially that will allow diffusion across the fetal maternal you know interface. So certain things can get across and certain things can't. So I mean, just because you found them in the placenta, right. maybe that was doing its job and it's you know protecting like it from plastic. getting to the baby but umbilical cord study is actually looking what's in the baby's blood they found a long list of chemicals you know and it comes from like our nonstick cookware and our plastic water bottles and you know cosmetics and all the things that pregnant women put on their bodies you know spray tanning i mean i could throw out so yeah. many things we're sitting here talking about diet and exercise <laughs> which we think are like the basics but there's so much crap that pregnant right. women are exposed to that really have detrimental effects right, just probably the on the baby stuff. yeah so back to, oh, sorry. back to the nutrition, if you were going to, if someone was watching like macros and they're trying, you know, you have a phys- physically fit person who's always done that. Are you like one to one pound to gram of protein? Is that like your recommendation? Is it more than that? Or whatever, grams to kilo, yeah. whatever it is. So like the recommended dietary allowance is like at 80 grams, which is really set at breakfast for an adult. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. These, these requirements are set at a a level to basically ensure that there's no deficiency. That is definitely not optimal. So when we talk about it's a catabolic state, you're breaking down your amino acids. I am in the camp of really pushing that limit. So like one to one, like yeah. pound a, And you have to know, I mean, yeah. she's going to gain weight too, right? But it doesn't mean you suddenly need like, you know. Now are you lot, basing that number off of like if they're working out as well? Because I think that number is going to vary a little bit if they're going to work out along with, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I mean basically you body's... can't overeat protein. I mean, you just can't. There's like the Institute of Medicine says there's no upper limit. So there's no level that's going to do harm to the pregnancy. So I think it's good to push that limit of protein um, throughout the pregnancy. And as you go from first, second to third trimester, the, the need increases. Now maternal hunger will increase first trimester. Most of these women feel horrible. I mean, they might be dealing with nausea, vomiting, but appetite isn't really increased in the first trimester. Um, and I've seen even women, uh, who are on carnivore diets have like horrible meat aversions in the first trimester. So it's the first trimester can be really brutal, but once you get, once you get past 20 weeks of pregnancy into that second, half maternal appetite is generally increased and it's not hard for them to want to eat it just Um, what they're eating yeah yeah but i i think it's good to push the protein requirements one to 1.2 grams you know per pound of body weight would be kind of like there's probably not a lot of advantage of going over that um And because half of the amino acids are glucogenic and because there's this insulin resistance, I mean, I don't think like more is always better, um, but getting enough fat, um, fatty acids are super important for baby's brain development and neurological development. So you don't, like I said, you don't want to be just eating lean protein. You want to get good. But you have steak or chicken thighs instead of chicken breast. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of different options. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then when we were talking about like the, the comeback afterwards, how long do you usually recommend they wait before training. I had a girl who had had a baby and she was referred to me by a friend. So I talked to her and she was like, Oh yeah, I just had my baby like three weeks ago. And I was like, so you want to start working out now? (laughs) She was like, I go, is that like 
okay. Like, I don't want to hear uterus to fall out while we're fucking going on here. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, and she's like a nurse anesthetist. She's like, no, nah, I played softball last week. And I was like, okay, well, you know, whatever you want to do. It stayed in. It stayed in. Okay. So, okay. So for a vaginal delivery, there, there really aren't physical restrictions. Now they did just go through this incredible, you know, event that happened that is very hard in the body. But just think about like, if you, you know, going back to the analogy, if you did an Iron Man or whatever, what does somebody do when they recover from that? Right. It might take a couple of days off mm -hmm. and then they get back into training, but at a lower intensity. So I don't think it's good advice for somebody that has a normal birth to tell them that they need to take six weeks off. I mean, a lot of deconditioning can happen in six weeks for sure. Now they also have a newborn baby and they're breastfeeding and they're sleep deprived. I mean, so to, to say to that person, like, okay, well, you need to get back in the gym and do your one hour of training today. Like, why are you so lazy? That's probably not great advice either. I mean, they need to be getting nutrition. They need to be getting sleep when they can. But I mean, I tell pregnant women, go walk, you know, go get some sunlight, get outside with your baby, just start pushing the stroller around, you know, start with that. But if they're ready for it, I think it's okay to start escalating that. The big problem, uterus on the floor, we don't want that. Yeah, that's um, bad. <laughs> is, the, is the pelvic floor and the core have been under an incredible amount of stress carrying this baby. So even in patients that have C-sections, the pelvic floor gets incredibly weak just trying to hold that big uterus up the whole. I mean, you guys can imagine if, if, if I told you to carry around like a 30-pound kettlebell for like nine months or whatever it is, I mean, that you would start to really fatigue because most time you guys do your reps and then you take a rest period. Well, in pregnancy, there's no rest period. That pelvic floor is literally just trying to hold that thing up for so long. And then you push this baby through the pelvic floor. There is some recovery that has to happen with the core and the pelvic floor. Now I'm a huge fan of pelvic floor physical therapy. And Someone a lot just of asked the, me about that this morning. A lot of yeah. the pelvic PTs, you know, want the patient to take a couple of weeks to kind of, you know, quote unquote recover. But I think it would be fine to start to get into PT as soon as your physical therapist will allow it. Um, and it's really that you talked about, you know, nerves and kind of that, that mind body connection. It's learning how to like re-engage the core, re-engage the pelvic floor, because if you put that woman into doing compound movements right away and that area everywhere. It's going to be, yeah, <laughs> yes, that too. I, uh, as an example, I, my third child, I, I had a pretty decent postpartum depression with my, with my three pregnancies. And I think a lot of it is I'm a very kind of like type a go, go, go personality. So maternity leave for me sounds like hell. Um, like there's only so many episodes of Maury Povich you can watch and there's only so many diapers you can change before you like want to go crazy. And I love my children dearly. But after my third pregnancy, I knew that I had to get back to exercising. So I, so I you guys, there's like a boxing gym in town. So I went in there and I was seven <laughs> days postpartum. And the guy is like, do you have like clearance from your doctor? And I was like, yeah. Me. Yeah. <laughs> this person right here. And he's like, uh, okay. And so like seven days postpartum, I was like doing this <clears throat> boxing class. I'm like leaking milk everywhere. I'm like peeing my pants on every single part of the circuit. I mean, I was like a hot mess when I went out of there. But, uh, I mean, I do think you can overdo it for sure, yeah. but I think it's important to, it, to move. And if that's something that helps your mental health too, because postpartum anxiety and depression are very real. And I think exercise can be helpful for that, but it is starting back at, you know, you're not at a hundred, you're at 50 now and kind of working your way back up. What's a, what would you say an average weight gain is for a healthy female that's not obese or, you know, not super trained either, but so if, somebody that just wants just to kind of yeah. not gain too much weight when they're pregnant. So if you come into pregnancy at a normal BMI, because we still use BMI, Fresh. the average Shut weight up, gain yeah. should be 25 <laughs> to 35 pounds. So for most patients, it's 25 to 35 pounds. But you have to remember, like, they're going to birth like a six to eight pound baby. There's amniotic fluid. There's placenta. I would say most women leave the hospital 10 or 12 pounds less than, you know, when they came in. Um, but... If you came in at a higher, I, I, I hate, I freaking hate, can I cuss? I don't you know. Can yeah. You can say all of it. That's great. I fucking hate BMI. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, good. Tell me about it. I'm yeah. Good. Yeah. We, just we just had talk, a talk about this. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about we're, we're in the same camp. Yeah. But, if you, but if you come into the pregnancy overweight, those weight recommendations go down. Even in morbidly obese people, there's still a recommendation to gain 10 pounds. 
but I've seen some of these women suddenly start like making better food selections and exercising and they gain no weight for the whole pregnancy and they have perfectly healthy, normal babies. So like I said, the body will take like what it needs. And certainly if you come in overweight, you have a lot of extra energy stores that the body can tap into. Not necessarily nutrients, but that's a nice way of putting it. Fat calories. Extra yeah. energy stores. So um, <laughs> that's what I always tell people about me. Yeah. It's just extra energy. But it's not uncommon these days to see generator. women gaining 40 pounds, 50 pounds. I've seen a woman Whoa. gain 60 pounds in a pregnancy. So um, excessive maternal weight gain has complications. And of course, then you have to get the weight off at some point. So, and most women don't do that. And then they get pregnant again, and then they get pregnant again. And that's where, and then they're just like, that's off the rails. Screw have it, there I ever been up. obese women that lost weight? I have had patients lose weight. Um, there it is. Like I said, L- suddenly, you know, suddenly <laughs> they uh, decide they want to start eating healthy and th- they will lose some weight. I- I've seen patients lose significant weight from, from nausea vomiting, and that can definitely happen. We get real concerned when they lose about 10% of their body weight. That's kind of the like well, that's shit not moment. Good because they're not getting any nutrients. In <laughs> right, doing, right. Yeah. Um, and they actually tend to grow perfectly normal babies. Like I said, the body is incredible. It will just right. find what it needs. So. Who knew? Who knew bulimia would really help you lose weight like that? <laughs> <laughs> not a recommended way. But. My favorite is the uh, I didn't know I was pregnant people. Well, then hit that show. Mm-hmm. You're 400 pounds. You thought you had gas pain for nine months? Yeah. I've, I've, se- I've seen it in real life. It's, I don't know. I don't know. You it happens. Take like it you see, like, they come in and they're like, my yeah. tummy hurts. And you're like, well. Damn. Yeah. So how far have they gotten, though? Like, how, what's the. Oh, I've seen full term babies. Wow. Yeah. And like they, they just come in like, oh, man. <laughs> and honestly, we don't really know the gestational age because they've never been scanned or had prenatal care. But, you know, we can estimate based on the development of the baby. We're like, yeah, this is a full term baby. I've seen it before. And, I, you shit. know, who knows if they're in denial if they're, yeah, yeah. or, like, what, you know, what the real story is. But. Dude, tell me you've watched Thousand Pound Sisters. And oh, she, right? goes, she goes, I think I might be pregnant. I'm craving oh, weird stuff. I just stuff. saw that clip the other day. <laughs> like what? Water. <laughs> she's she's like, like, you're thirsty. You're not pregnant. <laughs> she's like, bitch, you're thirsty. Drink some water. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, <laughs> Whenever you feel down, you just watch a show like, oh, oh right? your day so much better. <laughs> oh, my God. Definitely. Um, and then we were, so I think we got covered that. Anything else got anything on the training, pregnant? That was a lot of great stuff. Yeah. Anybody else, anything? No? Workout. Right. Yeah, work out, do don't it. we? Um, do and then you had some stuff like the perimenopausal. Yeah, I have a lot of female clients that are entering that perimenopausal, uh, menopause, yeah. postmenopause. They're your favorite clients, aren't they? <laughs> they really, <laughs> well, they are because they work really hard. Yeah. But it's like, I always, like, I will tell them, like, this is going to be like pounding your head against the wall for Return a while. Return on investment is low. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But, like, you'll just see, and the, I meet with them weekly, so it's like over a period of time I can show them, but... The first thing they say is everything I've been doing in my entire life does not, not work anymore. Yep. So one of the things that I've been, and I wanted to ask your opinion on it. You're the expert. Uh, the first things that like I was trying to get them to work on is sleep, stress, and protein. Yeah. Is that, but what else? So when you, let's just talk about why it's happening. So as women enter these years prior to menopause, there are a a slow reduction in sex hormones. So they don't always start losing testosterone, but they start losing estrogen production. And estrogen is actually very good for our lean mass. So what happens is they start losing this estrogen production is they are at a higher risk of lean, lean mass loss. So, and that actually starts in our thirties for most women. Um, they'll lose about 1% muscle mass. They'll start to lose about three to 5% of their, uh, strength and power. And then they start to really lose their speed and explosiveness. So we start to see this, this shift from fast twitch muscle fibers into more slow twitch. So the, the trouble with that is then as you just become less strong and less explosive and less powerful, you just start to do less strong, powerful, explosive things in your life, right? Like you just like take the elevator instead of the stairs and they might not even notice they're doing these things, but that lean mass loss um, starts to affect their metabolism. So they naturally, as they lose estrogen, start to become more insulin resistant. They start depositing more visceral fat around the organs. So they'll say like, I'm doing the exact same things. I've gained 10 pounds and my pants don't fit. And they are pissed. Yep. Um, I see it literally every day in my clinic. Um, and it's not just sex hormones. So they're losing estrogen, but they're also losing growth hormone. They're losing, you know, IGF-1 production. So there's a lot of hormonal changes that are happening. And, um, 
I say control the controllable. So my like five pillars that I wrote about in my book is like even more important when you turn 40. So it's getting adequate dietary protein because we know that that can be the best thing at leveraging muscle protein synthesis. You can still, you can still grow muscle even when you're 40, even when you're 80. Um, but they really have to leverage that protein in the diet and the and, leucine in the, the high leucine count protein. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and the thing about protein, I mean, we have done studies where we took one, one group, uh, that was on an isochloric diet. And then we took the, the second group and we gave them 300, um, additional calories from protein only. So now they're eating more calories than the other group and they actually lost more fat. So I, that is the important thing that women need to know is even if you're getting a higher percentage of calories from protein, it's not, it's not going to make you fat. It is, it is only going to help you and it's only going to leverage, you know, leucine and the amino acids that you need. Um, and most of that comes from animal proteins. It's just a better, uh, it's a more quality protein. So if you have, you know, a client that is like on a plant-based diet, that is like one of my, I don't, hate vegans it's just it's just not it's okay we do it's, <laughs> it's just not an optimal strategy unless you, wanna, unless you want to massively supplement and so it's God not bless, real, it's you not know, real life you, no it's just like it's not a good strategy for well it's hard to get a high leucine count protein from a plant-based product i yeah. mean you get you you can do it it just takes a lot of work and a lot of research when you can just eat eggs meat. Yeah. And there's way. actually Donald <laughs> Lehman. He's one of the, the best amino acid researchers out there. He, there's, there's something new coming out called the EA nine, which is essentially going to take every single, single amino acid and make them their own macronutrient. <laughs> <laughs> it stick with me. And <laughs> when you compare plant and animal foods, it, it will show you why it's such a poor strategy to try to get your amino acids from plant foods yep. from a caloric standpoint yeah. you would just have to eat massively large amounts of more calories to get the the specific the amino acids yeah. that you need you know and, and leucine of course is the one that everyone talks about so um yes okay so back to the original question yes leveraging protein continuing to do resistance training um focusing more on fast twitch fibers i love sprinting it's not what 40 and 50 and 60 year olds want to do but it is a good strategy um, getting good sleep and in perimenopause is a common time to see sleep disturbances. So as we have loss of estrogen, we also have loss of progesterone and progesterone is a hormone that really helps women get deep quality sleep. Um, they start to get hot at night and they're not sleeping well and they wake up at 3am and they can't fall back asleep. Once again, not helping their body composition. Um, and then alcohol is a huge one. Unfortunately, if you care about your body composition, it's just, it's just not a great thing. And I see a lot of women that are having a couple of glasses of wine at night. And, you know, so I get it. I like to have fun. I like to have a cocktail every once in a while. But if they're really beating their head against the wall about their body composition and not seeing return on investment in the gym, it may be something that they need to cut back on and just have an honest conversation about. So a couple of things. Um, one, with your sprint training, um, do you have, because I've been recommending some like sprint training, I've been recommending a bike because I feel like it's easier on your joints. Um, it's easier to hit that, that top sprint threshold that I think, I mean, even for me being a guy in my forties, it's hard to it, like sprinting hurts. Yeah. <laughs> <Especially laughs> head right um, <laughs> You got to wear a neck brace. So I know. Bounce got this head bobbling around. Um, but like, I feel like a bike can push that. What do you like? Do you have any thoughts? Yeah. I mean, you can do it on a bike. Um, I think it's a great place to start. You're okay. less likely to tear a hamstring. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's the dangerous part about sprinting is you have to like work your, work your yeah. way up, especially when you've lost a lot of your speed and explosiveness. I think a bike is a great way to start, um, you know, and doing, you know, whether it's eight or 10 sets of just like all. And, and that's the thing is women don't, it's like, it's all out. This is like literally everything you got, but it does, it's for a short amount of time. Are you recover. like 30, 30? Yeah. I mean, I think you can do a lot of different combinations, you know, 30 on 30 off would be like traditional, like Tabata type yeah. training. And it's hard, you know, um, I think a bike is a great way to start. Okay. Yeah. Um, strength training. So I feel like a lot of women, like just changing that stimulus up to hitting like if you want to lift and you want to do your 10 to 15 rep sets, I think that's fine. But at least like your for your big muscles, let's just say squat, bench, deadlift, those are the three biggest compound lifts. Like 
do you recommend like a three by three, like a five, like to five by five, something to generate more of that stimulus to build muscle in a different way than what I think a lot of women normally do? Women actually tend to do pretty good with more reps. Women are harder to fatigue in the gym. And a lot of that has to do with their estrogen. So then as they lose it, then it, then the conversation starts to change. Um, I don't know that there's like good, well-designed studies that say that, you know, lower volume or, you know, less rep, higher weight is, is better. I, I, I was just saying for like one, like one exercise in your group. Oh, okay. Of, see what you're saying. Yeah. Just so like do yeah. a three by three or five by five and then go ahead and move on to your other stuff. But I, I feel like that stimulus, like you're talking about estrogen, you're talking about estradiol specifically, correct? Yeah. Because yeah. that's the more anabolic of the estrogens. Right. It's not, it, I don't know that it's anabolic it's anti-catabolic okay. so and it's great for recovery so like in a in a menstruating woman um there really isn't a change in strength across the follicular and luteal phase but the rate of perceived exertion is extremely different and i can tell you that from personal experience <laughs> so if a woman's in the first part of her cycle like her recovery is so much better for her first two weeks yes okay. the first two weeks they can really push the weights they recover faster they can come back the next day um, when they get into luteal phase and start to lose that estrogen production, their strength doesn't really go down, but the rate of perceived exertion is so much different and they don't recover as fast. So this is a time to maybe do, you know, like higher reps, less weight, not be doing, you know, like three by three or something like so that. In the, so in your first two weeks of your, on a normal menstruation cycle, your estrogen's high thickening. Yeah. The yeah so uterus, it starts right? to build up in those yeah. first seven days, days like seven to 14. Like I would be going for the PR. Okay. And then your progesterone time. is, comes into balance. Everything progesterone out. doesn't start getting made until yeah, the second half of the cycle, so that's why... but it's the progesterone that makes them like sleepy and, yeah. and kind of bloated and they get a little more blood sugar instability and their mood starts to like get a little bit more deranged and you know your wife wants to bite your head off and you know this isn't not, this is yeah. not just perimon- perimenopausal you're talking that's, about. Pr- that, that's well, normal that's, cycle that's right? normal but in perimenopause it becomes even more erratic like if i showed you guys a graph of what happens with estrogen and perimenopause i i literally describe it as psychotic like all it's like twice as high as it's supposed to be and then it's twice as low as it's, it's really but day over day week over week month over month year over year it's trending down so how many, how many if, times are people saying they have this and they're just crazy? Don't shoot me for saying that, but I'm just saying a lot. You don't, know, don't well, like I think the messenger. Women, I'm just asking. I think a lot of people use it as like an, how do you know as if an you really are? Too. You know like, what I mean? I'm just very menopausal. Yeah. How do you yeah. how do you know if you re- that is really what's going on, or if you're just yeah. you know? Well, the the how often are they having a menstrual cycle? If they're still having monthly menstrual cycles, they're they're, they might be getting close, but they may not be there. Once a, once your client says like, yeah, I'm missing periods. I'm like now, now we're in a deficit, you know? But don't we also have a period of time to where you're having a normal menstrual cycle or like you're having it monthly, but you're just not releasing an egg. So it's screwing up your hormones even more. Yeah. So there, there can be reasons, um, in younger women, PCOS is the most common one when women will become anovulatory. Um, and that's, uh, that is a state of excessive amounts of estrogen and a relative lack of progesterone. And that's, uh, we talk about how awesome estrogen is, but like more isn't necessarily better. So these women are at a higher risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, complications in pregnancy. Killing their so, husbands. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> their um, yeah. So in, in a woman, so the, the earliest a woman would normally go through menopause is 45. You can see perimenopausal changes a couple years prior to that. So, I mean, statistically, if a woman's in her early 40s, there might be some changes happening. Now, the average age of menopause in the United States is between 51 and 52. So it's probably going to be your older 40s client that's really experiencing a lot of this lack of, of hormone production. And sometimes testosterone is low, too. And low testosterone will, you know that is an anabolic hormone. They'll lose their, their, their muscle mass. They're, they're just fatigued. They're tired. They're irritable. They have no sex drive. So that is another one that we think of as a male hormone, but it's also can be seen in women. That well, low T symptoms in men and women are pretty much the same. <laughs> pretty much. But men have 10 to 30 times higher amounts. Exactly. So yeah. it's very, you know, I mean, in men, it's like easy, like erectile dysfunction, like, okay, there's clearly something wrong in women. Like, 
you can't they don't have a record. <laughs> so, <laughs> do, do some do some women do testosterone therapy? Yeah, yeah. Therapy. So I do so hormone replacement the, therapy in my clinic. I use testosterone replacement. The caveat with it is like in our town, for instance, some women are getting really super physiologic levels. And of course they feel amazing. Like it's like, you know, like I've never done cocaine, but I can imagine it's like, you know, you give somebody cocaine, it feels amazing. Different podcast. So, <laughs> <laughs> the trouble is if you, if you treat women with super physiologic levels, it is an androgenizing hormone. So they will get deepening of the voice. They'll get acne, they'll get dark hair growth and they'll get hair loss. And these are things that most women don't, don't want, but they feel good. Yeah. Right? Uh, right. Unless you are a professional so bodybuilder how- <laughs> and you don't care that you have clitter megaly and are bald. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. Yucky. <laughs> is that what you have? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. so when you do the... Oh, sorry. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. When you're doing the testosterone replacement with them, um, like I've had a client before who has done it and had the pellets. Yeah. But I've heard bad about the pellets because if you ever have any kind of... And you tell me if I'm wrong on this. If you have some kind of cancerous... Because the you know when you do an injectable, you have the half life of the injectable. It's going to leave your body faster. Where the pellet is a continuous. So there's no FDA approved testosterone replacement therapy for women in the United States of America. What? That is its own podcast. Um, for Just sure. bathtub chemist. We yeah. don't know those guys. So it's approved in other countries, but not in the U.S. So we we have to either prescribe them pharmaceutical grade testosterone for men and microdose it. So we can send in like androgel and like give them these tiny little syringes like, okay, just do like a teensy bit on your arm or whatever. Um, Or we have to use compounded. So pellets are compounded. Injections are compounded. Um, uh, We can also use sublingual and we can get compounded creams. So when you are talking about testosterone pellets, it's essentially giving somebody a three to four month dose at a time, which means you're going to see higher peak levels. So pellets will peak at like six weeks. And so this is the tough part, like I said, about super physiologic levels is even if you're trying your best and doing a really conservative dose on a pellet, they're always going to get a super physiologic peak with a pellet. So at six weeks, their levels could be anywhere between, you know, a hundred to 300, which 300 is like the lower end of like male hormones. I've seen women with seven, eight, 900 in this town being treated at clinics. So just like were they just ripped? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's the problem. <laughs> but their hair was falling out and they had clitter Um, And so uh, you have to be cautious with pellets and with injections with women because you can really get mm-hmm. high levels and the side effects that most women don't want. Um, they're, they're very convenient because most people who aren't taking daily prescription medications don't want to be messing around with having to take a pill and do a gel. And the trouble with gels and creams is for about two hours, you can transfer yeah. them. So you can rub them on your partner. You can rub them on your kid. I saw a lady who was like, um, picking up her dog after she did her testosterone. She was like ro- <laughs> roiding out her dog. The vet figured it out. This like, there was something wrong with the dog and they like drew labs and I don't know. It's testosterone. Her dog like, is so was, like, her, like tiny little Pomeranian. <laughs> <Are> your <laughs> dog is 300. What the Just fuck? Tackling so, squirrels out back and bring them back. <laughs> so there's like pros and cons to all the ways of giving it. Um, so when I use uh, testosterone creams, like I'll have you, women use like their inner thigh, or you can even use the labia, but you want to put it on a place where we're not going to be like rubbing up on somebody two hours later. So the old labia applications got to be soups awkward if anyone's around. On <laughs> but that those deal. are daily applications. So yeah. when you do something like that, you have to do it daily. So you're going to get lower, you know, lower peaks, but it's going to be more physiologic dosing. Yeah. So, and it's those really just, you know, terrible. patient, what do they want to do? You know, what's convenient to them? Um, you have to be careful with pellets and injections in women. And see, I was just sort of the pellets thing. Like if you, cause obviously you're increasing cell replication. Yeah. So if there's any kind of cancerous cells, you can't. Oh yeah, that was the, your original question. So you the mean pellet like breast is, cancer. Well, because the the pellet is going to keep feeding. Yeah. You know, so you can't I, I know take you, it out. You yeah. can't take it out. That's the thing. Once you put it in, yeah. it's going to be there for three to four months, and you can't take it out. Um, and so yeah, if they had a testosterone pellet placed and they get diagnosed with breast cancer the next day, there's going to be some what we call aromatization. So testosterone gets converted into estrogen in the body, and early breast cancer cells retain their estrogen and progesterone receptors. So if a woman's on hormone replacement therapy, you can, you can feed a cancer cell. Now we do not have any evidence that shows that hormone therapy causes a breast cell to turn into a breast cancer cell, but breast cancer is the most common cancer in women, a one in eight lifetime risk. So I tell women, if you have a cluster of cells in your breast right now that I can't see on mammogram, you can't feel it. I can't feel it. And I put you on hormone therapy 
and you suddenly get diagnosed, I mean, it can make it grow. So that's the the thing is you want to do your screening and, you know, be vigilant. What are your personal risk factors? Um, but the conversation about risk of breast cancer and hormones, I mean, alcohol increases your risk significantly yeah, more. I mean, yeah, you're Lack splitting hairs, sleep, yeah. being obese, like... The, you know, we, the list could go on and on and on. Well, most of the research on hormones is really bad anyways. Like on the, like testosterone and stuff, like one of the ones they used for men was a study in the 1950s that had three people in it. Two of them dropped out. It was one person who was chemically castrated. And that's what all the research, like well, all your recommendations and men have done. been studied far more than women. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of the studies that came out with women were done with, you know, synthetic ethanol estradiols. Um, conjugated equine estrogens from cow urine, um, synthetic progestins, and they're like, oh my god! I did hear about the cow causes- urine one. Yeah, so or horse these- was it horse or cow? Sorry, horse urine. Yeah, yeah. it was horse. Horse yeah. urine. Um, I said equine, and then I said cow. Um, <laughs> and so the the trouble is, is that for many years, women were fear mongered about hormones, and a lot of clinicians were fear mongered about it. And so there's like a whole, you know, couple decades of women that really weren't even given the opportunity to talk about hormone replacement therapy. Um, I'm a huge fan of it from, uh, the conversation that we've talked about today. I mean, you know, if you want to talk about longevity, women will live about 40% of their lives post-menopausal. Um, that's damn near half, um, by my gynecology math. So, uh, (laughs) so, I mean, if you want to talk about like living an amazing life into your fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth decade, uh, or hell, like live to be a hundred, you want to maintain your lean mass. And that's the best thing you can do to protect yourself from dying of cancer, from dying of heart disease, from dying of diabetes. And we know that estrogen's anti-catabolic testosterone obviously is anabolic and, if you don't do hormones, that's okay. I know this is a natural process that 100% of women go through, but thankfully it's becoming a conversation again in the clinics because uh, there are, for most women, more benefits than risks when you start at menopause and about 10 years beyond. So let's just say we're getting into like our <clears throat> late 30s, early 40s. Some things that women should be focusing on, like we talked about, protein, lean mass. What about what, do, what are you feeling like adaptogens uh, like early on in the process? Yeah, like ashwagandha, maca. Yeah, these things are you know hard to study because there's a lot of confounding things, right? It, like it'd be hard to give somebody ashwagandha and say, in whatever the the end point was of your research, that the ashwagandha was like causative, right? Yeah. Um, with that said, I don't know that they're harmful. I do see women come in with like backpacks of supplements and they feel like (laughs) shit. And I'm like, so is this backpack helping you? Like I'm confused. So I'm always a fan of like the foundational things. Like, are you training? Is your diet good? Are you getting good sleep? And then supplements are great at like filling the gaps. But for women that think that some sort of like adrenal support is going to be magical to them when they're like (laughs) drinking seven cups of coffee and their marriage sucks and they're stressed out and they're not training and they eat like shit, like, her adrenal support is not helping <laughs> her. Right. They're thinking like the supplement's going to be the foundation of their pyramid. But really, it's the tip. Like this is I like well, once everything else is in yeah. line. Like when nootropics get, were a thing, right. and then you saw the movie Limitless. You're like, so if I just take like this ginseng, I'm going to be like, that. I'm gonna be like yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> bring <Good> work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I think they can be supportive tools, but they they really aren't magical if you're not doing these foundational things. What about gut health? Oh Women in gut health. I mean, one of the fastest area, you know, areas that's growing in the research is the microbiome. And uh, I can give you an example in pregnancy. So they've discovered uh, about 10 different bacteria that are in a woman's mouth that increase the risk of preterm birth, preeclampsia, adverse uh, stillbirth, miscarriages. Holy shit. So when we talk about the microbiome, we have to understand that when I deliver a newborn baby, the gut is pretty much sterile. And the stomach actually does not have stomach acid in it for about 24 to 48 hours. And that is to allow those bacteria to get through the stomach and to populate the gut. So the first feed, that first breastfeed that happens, um, you know, on the mom's nipple, on the mom's skin, the bacteria it's exposed to in the, in the birth canal, uh, or maybe not, right? If it was a C-section baby, those are the bacteria that are starting to populate our, our gut. And then based on our diet and sleep and all these different inputs, that microbiome shifts. And so we know there's particular bacteria that are really good early in life. And then we know as we age, that starts to shift. And then everything we do in our life affects it. So, you know, alcohol, food, sleep, training, you know, all these things. What's cool though about the microbiome is 
we know that like nutritional changes will start to see diversity shift in like just a couple of days. So cleaning up your diet, I mean, even within days, we'll start to see this shift, but, but it all starts in the mouth. So like if you have bad teeth, if you're like, if you're having to see the dentist a lot, that is like a huge red flag that there's something going on with your microbiome. So everyone thinks like it's gut issues. Like I don't poop right. Like I don't, my tummy hurts or whatever it is, but like it all starts in the mouth. Like the bacteria gets to the gut through the mouth. So taking care of your teeth, um, checking your airway, nasal breathing, like there's a whole, I, I mean, I think it's cool. The microbiome is really, like I said, one of the fastest growing areas of research and these bacteria probably control our health more than we ever realized. Yeah. And what a great analogy, you guys are like, shut up. Stop talking. Um, (laughs) Is, um, I had this microbiome researcher on my podcast and this, I thought this was a great analogy for people to understand. So think of your microbiome like a cruise ship. So you've got this cruise ship with like a captain and all these passengers. So that's called your commensal bacteria. So everyone's supposed to be like happy. We're, we're on the Royal Caribbean cruise. We're all having fun, right? Um, you can get a pirate that gets on board. And once a pirate gets on the ship, um, they will ransack the place. They will, you know, create chaos and havoc. And they're really, really hard to get off of the cruise ship. So these 10 bacteria that I was referring to were like pirates within the mouth. And we now have the ability to test for these pirates. And we know some within the gut too, like H. pylori. Everybody's heard of that one, right? Um, So we know about some of these pirates and there's probably a lot more. But if you have a pirate, that's a a bad thing. But if you can keep your, your cruise ship happy, most of the time you can crowd out the pirates. So what people need to understand is although these bad bacteria, you'll get exposed to them throughout your life. If you're doing these like good foundational things, Things, most of your cruise ship passengers will kick their ass and throw them overboard. So that's why it's so important to like eat whole foods, to train, sleep well. I know it just sounds like we're like beating a dead horse, but if we take care of our bodies, our microbiome will take care of us. So yeah. a lot of stuff starts in the gut. And yeah. People, yes. Yeah. People don't understand that. So. Yeah. Neuro, like brain neurotransmitters, like a lot of things, almost yeah. everything. What happened to you then? You've been eating good. You shared your hands twice last night. <laughs> I don't know. I've really yeah, that may have been good. a sphincter problem. Yeah. <laughs> it's not been a mouth thing. It's one of the <laughs> portholes. Yeah. Right. It was a structural problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, one of the back back of the ship porthole. Your porthole is malfunctioning. Pirates. Yeah. <laughs> so you did the Titan Games. What was that like? Oh my gosh. I'm sure you've asked this question like a million times. Yeah. But. Yeah. Well, it's been four years now. It was so fun. I, uh, you know, when I did Titan Games, uh, first of all, it was kind of something that came out of nowhere. I was in the operating room one day and one of the scrub techs was like, Oh my gosh, Dr. Seaman, you should try out for that Titan game show. And I had no, I had never even heard of it. I don't, I don't really watch TV to be honest. So of course I had to go Google it and I looked this up and I'm like, this is American gladiator. You're like, fuck yeah, yeah I'm this in. Is fucking cool. I mean, you guys, I like wanted to be diamond when I was a little girl. Like that was most people American were watching gladiator Barbie and I was like, show. I want to be oh, her. Fucking good. So cool. Fucking um, And so I I looked up the application and it was like all this crazy shit, like do 10 pull-ups and this and that. And you have to like talk into the camera while you're doing it. And I was like, there's no way I can do this. I mean, I was, I had just come out of like having three kids. I was early in my, you know, medical career and, um, it, I, there was so much self doubt. I mean, it had been 13 years since I had competed as a collegiate athlete and I was not back in the gym lifting weights for like, I'd only been back in the gym for like a year at that point. So like months went by and like any good competitor, it was like eating me alive. And I'm like, Oh my God, like how fun would that be? Like, just what if you apply and like, just don't make it. Nobody will ever know. So I sent in my application and like months went by, I didn't hear anything. And then around Christmas time of 2019, I got this phone call and they're like, Hey, we want you to, we want you to come out. And I thought I had like made it. No, no, no. We want you to come out to this tryout. I was like, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> like, well, what do I have to do? And they're like, well, we're not really going to tell you until you get here. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So, um, I flew out to Los Angeles and there's just like top 10 CrossFitters in the world. Like all these, like, incredible people. And like, here I am like a gynecologist from Nebraska, (laughs) (laughs) but the tryout involved like a max deadlift and a 40 yard dash and like a, um, a dead hang, like for as long as you can. And there was all these crazy things they had us do. Um, but, uh, I made it somehow it was, 
they called, they said, we get to fly you out here. It was filmed in Atlanta. So the rock moved to Atlanta a couple years ago and he was actually filming red notice at the same time that they were filming. Titan That's a great Day. show. So the red notice, uh, like the helicopter and all the stuff was like out in front of the sound studio. It was really cool now to like see the, the movie on Netflix and we watched part of it get filmed, but um, what a fun opportunity to like, I mean, the rock is cool. He's okay. Um, <laughs> But to compete, but it was wild because when we show up, like we didn't know what we'd be doing. So like my first event where you guys see me like scaling the chain link fence mm -hmm. thing, like literally like they walk you out there like, okay, so here is the uh, obstacle and you didn't get to touch it or practice or anything. So like, here's the point you're going to like do this and go around. There's this. no demo or anything. It's just nothing. hanging up there and they're like, like fucking literally it nothing. Out. Um, Can you watch the people that go in front of you or are you? No, no, okay. no. You're like, oh, it's just all blind. It yeah. was like totally blind. I mean, they took us out there. <laughs> And they told us how you're supposed to like run the course, but you literally like never touched it before that. So it was, that was wild because these are like not things that you normally do when you're training. Right. Like there was a lot more like climbing and overhead stuff than I ever imagined, which the producers of Titan games also produced Ninja Warrior. So I think my season and season two versus season one, there was a lot more ninja kind of stuff sure. um, included, but it was super fun. And it finishing in the top six, which I feel like um, six, you competed twice because you went to the regionals, right? So you were on it twice. So yeah. did they film those. How no, no, they did not film like the way you saw it on TV is like, not I was just saying, did you just stay and you film the same like so next I day was there until the last day. So basically it's kind of like the bachelor when you lose, they put you in the limo and send you away, but it's actually not a limo. It's like a shitty white van that takes you to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> hey, loser, there's your ride. <laughs> You're staying in like this, like scariest hotel. Like there was, it's like a really actually sketchy part of Atlanta called um, Union City, like really oh, high yeah. crime rate. Yeah, I thought I was going to die a couple times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just thought Atlanta was the sketchy part. So that's nice to know yeah it was the worst <laughs> but yeah. um but i was there actually until the very last day of filming and i was an alternate for the for the finale and so but the way they show it on tv i was totally different than how it was filmed so so like how long were you down there total then um three it was like almost three weeks i had to go down end of january and i came home oh, the shit. day after valentine's like you're day down there the whole time yeah so like 21 days i was down there and just was, in this sketchy part oh, of Atlanta. yeah and it's really <laughs> nasty hotel room it was so bad you guys i hope the rock is listening <laughs> what the hell like and the rock and Me his too. crew were staying in like the four seasons like 45 minutes north of right. there so. probably not riding in a shitty white van no <laughs> he's probably easy one of our dozens and of like, listeners yeah this is tv right so like they don't understand we're like where do we warm up and they're like what's warm up we're like you wait you want us to just like yeah run out there and do this like yeah. they shove a camera in your face to do their little pre-interview and then they're like okay on the count of three and then there's like um you guys saw on the the mount olympus thing mm -hmm. because it's a sound studio they had all these like pyrotechnics going off and so the smoke was like going up to the top we had a guy like collapse halfway through mount olympus with like carbon monoxide poisoning <laughs> from like all the pyrotechnics and stuff and so at some point that like open the garages. So it's, it's crazy because you have to remember it's TV and they want to make it awesome for TV. And so you're just like trying to win this competition and it's Hollywood. And it was just, yeah, it was wild. Like equipment would break and they'd be like, okay, stop. Like, okay, now we're going to start again. Like, so there was things that you guys didn't see on TV that happened that <laughs> it's just, do you yeah. remember your 40 time? So I, I don't, but what I do recollect about the 40 was that uh, five men tore their hamstrings. Uh, <laughs> one of the guys tore his hamstrings so badly, he ended up in an L.A. hospital the next day with rhabdo. Like, Ooh, wow. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, because like I said, a lot of these people. This is why know, I said start with the bike. No, <laughs> it's dangerous. But I, one thing I remember is my very first station was uh, the VO2 Max. And I Ugh. got my, in, my, we had like a group, I was like in group six and, um, in my group was a, a U.S. Olympic athlete who actually went to Nebraska at the same time as I did, uh, Shantae McMillan. She ended up, oh, yeah. you know, um, I ended up actually knocking her out in, in one round of the competition, but she, they put her on the treadmill next to me and she's like a decathlete, you know, whatever they do, like 10 events. <laughs> and I just remember thinking it was like a tap out thing. So they're like, we're going to put you on the treadmill. We're going to increase the, the incline and the speed until you hit stop. Like, so you just hit stop when you're done and you had all the monitors on. And I just remember thinking, I'm not going to hit it until she does. Like, so I'm just, I'm going to stay on the treadmill until she hits the button. Ooh, that's a life threatening figured, ordeal. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I'm not going to look at the clock. I had like a point on the wall. I was staring at, I could like see her in my peripheral vision and like as soon as she hit it, I hit it. But I was like, I'm, then I know I'm at least like doing okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, I hadn't, hadn't done a VO2 max test like 
since college. I was like an exercise science major. And then the dead hang was like a total mind fuck. Um, so you just had to hang from like a pull up bar, but you did, you couldn't see a time. And so oh, they just shit. said, fall off when you're done. And if you got to three minutes, they would tell you you were done. Three minutes was like the max or whatever. So that was like a total mind game. Um, and then I had to do max deadlift, which like I said, I had been back in the gym for like less than a year and I really wasn't deadlifting. So I'm like, God, I don't even know how much I can deadlift. Cause they're like, pick your first weight. It was kind of like us, you know, Olympic lifting where you get like three tries and I literally ordered a weight belt. They said you could wear a belt. So I ordered a belt before I flew to LA. It was, <laughs> Oh my gosh, you guys, <laughs> I ended up, I don't know. I ended up deadlifting like, um, I can't remember what my first attempt was, but it was like, you know, like mid two hundreds and it's incredible what you can do when you're like watching other people like do hard shit. Oh, for sure. Somehow find that like fifth gear. Yeah, you get you like sea biscuit mentality and oh you're like, oh, I gosh. see him. And then yeah. there was this wild thing. I never got the event on the show, but you guys saw the event where they would like swing from the platform and have to kick like these weights off of the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So one of the things they had us do at tryouts was they like hooked this like pulley harness thing to us and we had to like run and sprint and like see how high we could kick on this wall and we're all doing this like what are we doing like what what is the point how of does this? this translate to the yeah, show yeah and then there was Surprise. like a, an obstacle course we had to like pull a rope and then like push a sled and and i'm sure it was they were trying to figure out who was better at what events and trying to like equally pair yeah. and match people but it was yeah it was a total mind game yeah it was <laughs> a crazy experience so they flew you out there they put you in a shitty hotel <laughs> and stayed there for 20 so i went so did they give you a per diem or just everything was comped while they like they had food for you like um they flew us out there yeah obviously you know put us in this shitty hotel the food <laughs> the food yeah they they gave us meals and um if they didn't have a meal then they gave us per diem but literally they were gonna like let us just eat the hotel breakfast it was literally like Gross. packaged pastries and there was like no protein so finally like enough people complained we're like you guys we need like real food like you want us to go you know run mount <laughs> olympus on a i can't do that on bear claws get, give easy, us a, give easy some on the, the rocks food right, easy on the pop tarts <laughs> so uh yeah i it, said bear claws not pop tarts yeah it was it was uh yeah not and then not a great budget i don't think <laughs> well <laughs> <laughs> All their budget went to the rock. <laughs> right. And his yeah, they made it, friends. And it host. made it two seasons, right? You were on the second. Yeah, and honestly, I think the pandemic is what really screwed it. So we are we filmed in 2020. So I vividly remember sitting in one of the casting rooms making fun of the Wuhan China COVID virus thing. Now in ret retrospect, I'm like, holy shit. The, the Kung flu. <laughs> we're like, hey, I heard uh, flights to Wuhan are really cheap right now. We were like literally just making yeah. fun of it. And um, so then I flew back right after Valentine's Day. And then NBC was supposed to fly to Omaha to film me and my children at the house, like to do, it's called B-roll footage. So it's like all the, you know, cute story mm -hmm. that they show on the show. The day that they were supposed to fly out in March, um, NBC grounded all of the, the people and were like, you can't fly. So they called me and they're like, can you film this stuff for us? Like on your iPhone. <laughs> so when you guys watch <laughs> Titan games, there's like a clip of like my kids playing basketball in the driveway and me like flipping my daughter in the living room. Yeah. Like all that shit was like filmed on my iPhone <laughs> <laughs> nice. because of COVID. But our, our season wasn't supposed to show until the next year. So it wasn't supposed to be on TV till 2021. So we basically signed non-disclosures. Like I wasn't allowed to talk about it until it showed on TV. I was like, Oh my God, this is going to be like a long time to keep this secret well then the pandemic happened and the olympics got canceled which nbc carries the olympics and so nobody had any new content to show on tv when the pandemic hit and so they were rushing production of the show so we filmed in february they were still filming footage in march and then it, it debuted on memorial day weekend but they were making each episode as they went so they only had like one episode ready and then they got the oh, next geez. episode ready because no other like major yeah. tv station had like something filmed that they could show so that was kind of fun like during the pandemic yeah, at least that you didn't have to wait a whole on. year to wait a whole year so yeah that's awesome interesting <laughs> very interesting it's always surprising to hear about those shows because that's like seems to be a general theme of people who go like the way the way we see it from the viewer side it's like oh yeah. it looks super cool and everyone's like fuck no i spent the whole time in a goddamn hotel <laughs> there were so many nothing. injuries like i i actually tore my tricep i didn't really like make that huge public knowledge but i on the hand bike on mount olympus i i 
tore my tricep. I have this crazy picture with like, it's just bruised all the way back when I came back to Omaha. And then the, the fence thing, um, I lost like three fingernails. I, people's hands were like ripped open. Was it, like um, a, it was like legit fence, that right? That kick out <laughs> thing where you had to like kick the piston. Some of those, you guys saw like a five or six minute clip on TV. Some of those battles went on for like 30 minutes. Like there was like these two military brothers. I mean, they I were just guys. going at it forever. And they literally like, there was no skin left on either of their palms. Like it was disgusting. There was like so many injuries. <laughs> it was wild. Yeah. But you know, staying but in you like, sign a piece of paper that's like, yeah, you might die great. and you're doing this for TV. Like, Have fun. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Man. <laughs> but it, it kind of fit into where you said you want to be American Gladiator. Cause if you've ever seen the documentary on American Fucking Gladiators, awesome. oh, they got like injured. They were like, oh, yeah. Yeah. And most bad. of them were like major drug addicts and alcoholics. So staying in that hotel is probably similar to where they stayed. It's probably. <laughs> you probably lived really the stayed. gladiator life. <laughs> <laughs> that documentary was awesome. It, Dude, was, it was so good. cool. It was really good. Dude, they were just like, Alcoholics and just like whores, like everybody they was like fucking party. everybody. Like, yeah, it was a me disaster. Up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, disaster. That's a great time. In the early <laughs> shows that, that were like yeah. great, yeah, they're like, well, why don't just go up there and hit each other? If I see what happens, yeah, see what happens. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was a great show. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. There were there were some Titan Games hookups. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I won't call out names, but <laughs> no, I'm sure <laughs> yeah. it's like a Olympic Village. Don't they hand out condoms at the Olympic Village? There was a Titan yeah. baby actually. Oh, oh. is that known? I mean, I'm not going to. Yeah, I mean, yeah. no, I don't know that it's like public knowledge. <laughs> wow. You learn something new every day. Right? Yeah. That's great. Well, we appreciate you coming on. We had a good time. Yeah. Hopefully you did. Yeah. Thanks for having me. We learned some things. A few. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if you ever want to talk about uteruses falling out on your gym floor, you know where to find me. Well, you know. <laughs> or if one of them falls out, then call hey. me. Well, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully if we, uh, you want to come back sometime. Hopefully you had a good time with it. Um, but yeah, we appreciate you coming on. You guys got anything else? No. Thank sure. you. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. Guys. It was awesome. It's cool. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.